here. So I am Nancy. I am the program manager for IDTC. And rather than talk about me, I'm going to turn it over to everybody's favorite behaviorist, Laura Donaldson. Just a quick note that this is being recorded and the recording will be made available to Ithaca Dog Training Club members only. Please do not share this. So I'm turning it over to Laura. Thank you so much for coming and spending more time with us. As you can see, you're quite popular. You have the floor. <laughs> well, thank you, Nancy, for organizing this. And thank everybody for coming out. Um, always such a pleasure to talk to my fellow dog enthusiasts. Um, so I was just saying to, Na to Nancy um, at the beginning before people came on, this is going to be kind of a freewheeling presentation. So, um, oh, one thing, and Nancy, you, you can help me here. We are going to have a really robust question and answer period at the end because I really wanted this to be very interactive in a way that um, I think the presentation that I did with Kate Anderson wasn't able to be because we just didn't have a whole lot of time left over. Uh, so I, I want to make sure we do. But Nancy, do you want people to put their questions in the chat? or wait and we'll do it kind of live or both? Let's do both. I, I believe that you said you would like to speak a little bit first and then we'll yeah. get to the floor. Yeah. So I'll monitor for those people who are too shy to speak on air, I'll monitor the <laughs> chat. And for those people who are willing to unmute yourselves and ask a question, just make sure you're muted when you're not talking. And thanks. Super, super. Okay, I am going to share the screen here. Um, so, like I said, this is going to be kind of a freewheeling uh, presentation. I want to touch on a lot of bases, but um, it's partly to say there are many paradigm shifts happening in the dog training world at the moment. Um, and I happen to think most of them are really fabulous. They're long overdue. Um, but one of them is how we talk about behavior issues, especially issues of canine quote unquote reactivity. And as you'll discover as we go along, I actually don't want to use that vocabulary anymore. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little more about why. Um, and I think that's just so true of a lot of the vocabulary we use about dogs. Um, you know, things like reactive dogs. Well, if your dog wasn't reacting, <laughs> uh, then you would have a real issue. They'd probably either be really sick or, or, you know, not alive. Uh, every living being on the planet is reactive. So that vocabulary in and of itself is very misleading. And I think it doesn't lend itself to helping us be accurate about um, what we're seeing and experiencing with our dogs and uh, it certainly doesn't help in communicating that to the people we need to be talking to. So, um, but that's gonna come a little bit later. Right now, I this is really quick. I'm not gonna spend any time on it. The, the big, uh, I guess most salient pieces of this uh, very, very short resume is this is my email and this is my website. You can go to my website if you wanna find out more about the slow thinking course, or if you wanna send me a contact form from the website, these are two excellent ways of getting in touch with me. Um, and I really encourage you to do that. If we don't get your question 
answered tonight, please contact me and I will be happy to, um, you know, to respond to you. All right, so I actually want to start with, um, uh, and let me put this over here. I want to start with a really interesting <laughs> piece of research that came out. This is Casey et al. This is a UK-based uh, study that came out in 2013. Uh, and it's got, it's got some renewed traction lately. That is, um, there have been people discussing it and various workshops and, and online. And what they did was they took um, owner reported surveys. And of course, we know with owner reported surveys, you always have to take them with a grain of salt. Uh, but this had to do with dog dog aggression issues what causes it and what can we tell about dog dog aggression from uh looking at uh actually it was quite a large number of surveys and this was a cross-sectional convenient sample of dog owners that is these were voluntary um samples uh, I found it actually pretty startling for a number of reasons. One is the sheer percentage of households that reported they were struggling with issues of reactivity and aggression in their dogs. And um, this survey reported 22% of households, but suspected the number was actually much higher that 22% is a vast underrepresentation of um, aggression, especially if owners were defining aggression as only involving explicit bites, for example. But um, the most interesting takeaways for me were what they correlated the development of aggressive behavior with in dogs. And these actually are probably not the things that you might expect. Uh, for example, aggression towards dogs in the same household, that is intra-household aggression, was associated with the use of positive punishment, um, training techniques involving positive punishment, and I'll say more about that in a minute, and attending ring craft classes. Uh, that is, you know, classes that, that work with owners and their dogs in terms of how, uh, how to show them. Um, ring craft, uh, now, I, I think, that this probably has to do with most people who take ring craft classes also have multiple dogs in the household. Um, and of course, <laughs> that, that, that is where the owner reporting, I think, has some fungibility, um, which came first, the multiple dogs in the household or the ring craft classes. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Second, uh, aggression toward unfamiliar dogs was also associated with the use of positive punishment techniques and attending obedience classes or dog training classes for more than four weeks. Now, I thought this was really interesting um, and might be really interesting for uh, members of IDTC to think about uh, because you know you all are the big purveyor of dog training classes. Is there anything about this we can learn? Um, so I wanted to share some of the insights from the survey and just see, do they fit or not? Um, quite interesting. Laura, okay. Laura, quick question, which yeah. is, can you define positive punishment 
for the trip. Yeah. yeah. Please make sure you're muted. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to right now. <laughs> yeah. Risk factor number one is the use of positive fun punishment. And what do I mean by that? Well, here's a description of these are the actual techniques reported by owners in the survey, right? Um, jerking back on the lead, bark activated, uh, electronic collars, water pistols and spray bottles. I would include spray bottles in that. A nonverbal distractor, like a can filled with coins or stones, prong collars, remote activated citronella collars, ear or limp, uh, lip pinching. And of course, this is, a, this is an ear pinch right here. Um, now, there are other areas that are a little more, I guess, um, spongy, <laughs> verbal punishment. Okay, shouting, scolding, uh, would the use of the word no fit in there? I don't know, that, that, these are, the verbal punishment is a much grayer area in my mind. Uh, a pet corrector of any kind, this would be, um, uh, you, you know, now they actually have a thing called pet correctors, which are noise activated, spray activated, uh, of course, physical punishment, smacking with a newspaper, leash or hand, uh, shock collars, e-collars, electric fences. Uh, I know many, many, many people in this area use them, but uh, the bottom line is it's still a shock collar. And I could give you many stories of working with dogs who developed aggression issues because of their interaction with an electronic fence in their backyard or became afraid to go in the backyard because of their interaction with an electric fence. Um, that's a whole nother area. And then of course, alpha rolling, uh, which is uh, what, what is what this picture shows, probably not the whole full, alpha roll, but laying the puppy on its side as a way of disciplining the dog or giving the dog a timeout or however um, people describe it. These are all the actual techniques that the study classified as po positive punishment and that owners reported using. And these were the techniques that were associated with much higher levels of aggressive behavior developing in dogs than in households that use positive punishment. And um, I just want to say th this is totally um, complementary to the American Veterinary Society for, uh, for Animal Behavior that just put out their newest position statement on humane dog training. And this is evidence-based. It takes into consideration all the most recent science. And now the science is just overwhelming that positive punishment does not work. Um, that actually positive reinforcement is much more effective in teaching dogs new behaviors and uh, especially in addressing behavior issues like aggression or reactivity. And this is, the, this is just one statement from that statement. I am gonna send Nancy a copy of the statement to upload so people can look at it if they, if they want to. It's really worth reading in its entirety. Uh, very well done. Lynn Honickman, who I know, uh, who's a veterinary behaviorist, was chair of the committee that wrote this new study, and I highly recommend it. Um, 
evidence supports the use of reward-based methods for all canine training. And I think this is really important because what it doesn't include is balanced training. Like, okay, I'm gonna use some positive, but I'm also gonna use negative. No, uh, reward-based methods for all canine training. And um, AVSAB promotes interactions with animals based on compassion, respect, and scientific evidence. Based on these factors, reward-based learning offers the most advantages and least harm to the learner's welfare. Research supports the efficacy of reward-based training to address unwanted and challenging behaviors like aggression and like reactivity. There is no evidence that aversive training is necessary for dog training or behavior modification. And in at least several other studies uh, that, that have been done and published recently, these are peer reviewed studies. It was found that actually positive reinforcement training, reward-based training was more effective than um, aversive training even in the hands of skilled practitioners. That is um, people who were very skilled using aversive techniques. And that, that is definitely food for thought for all of us. Okay, so that's risk factor number one, the use of positive punishment. Risk factor number two, and I know <laughs> that many of you are gonna be interested in this one, more than four weeks in a dog training class? Um, and then the question is, good grief, why? Isn't this the answer to um, many behavior issues like aggression and, um, and reactivity? Well, it depends. That, that is what I would say. It depends on um, how the class is run because here, here are the statistics from this study. Right, and again, I'm gonna talk about some of the, I guess, sponginess of this data, but it's at least evocative enough to make us perhaps think twice about the way we're structuring classes. And I teach classes as well. So I, I definitely took this to heart. Attendance at obedience classes was associated with 1.8 times increased risk of dogs developing aggression to unfamiliar dogs. So this is not intra-household, this is with dogs they don't know. Um, and then the ring craft classes, uh, the, the increase for the risk of aggression was 3.8 times. That is the one I would want to investigate more. Um, Definitely. So then, of course, we need to ask, what is going on here? Isn't teaching classes, dog training classes, what, what we want to be doing? Well, I would say not necessarily. Um, and I, I think for all the reasons that we're going to be talking about, one thing I would strongly advocate for any club, any group, any person teaching dog training classes is to have a really robust screening process in place. Because that is one of the huge gaps that I see in, in contemporary dog training classes, not enough screening goes on and then you get dogs in class who never should have been there in the first place. And they cause all kinds of issues, not just with the other dogs, but with the learning process. Um, so what were some of the indicators of this um, increased association for developing aggression? Well, one is, and I know we've all been in classes like this, allowing free roaming interaction and play with dogs running off and visiting other dogs. 
uh, there's a lot of chaos, not enough management, not enough places that offer buffer zones for dogs who may be a little stressed and anxious about the environment. Uh, but this free roaming interaction, that is one of my particular, um, I guess, complaints. Uh, and I, I think that is one that you really see quite frequently. Um, and of course, the positive punishment training methods, dysfunctional venues. Uh, that is venues where it's very hard to control the environment. And that's what you need to have a well-run clash. You need to be able to control the environment, to put some um, stabilizing barriers in place, uh, you know, have ways for dogs to escape and maybe work behind uh, a barrier with a visual block. Um, places for dogs to be crated that don't actually expose them to all the chaos of the class, et cetera, et cetera. And then a uh, lack of appropriate training on the part of the instructors. And, um, you know, almost every instructor I know is putting their heart and soul into the class. So I, my plea would be to give, especially volunteer, instructors a lot more support and a lot more access to ongoing training um, so that they can then incorporate this into, into their classes. Now, this, everything I just said <laughs> may not necessarily be causal. Uh, and, and actually you could explain some of this by owners who actually use obedience classes as a way of seeking help with their aggressive dogs. And that is why I think IDTC, every other training group that I've spoken to, I make a plea for putting into place really robust screening mechanisms. Um, and this is, related to having, for example, a dysfunctional venue where there's not enough room uh, so that you have a huge amount of close proximity to other dogs where there's anxiety about social contact. And this may actually increase the risk of developing aggressive behavior. Um, the other piece of this, and, and this is uh, a kind of a little more subjective element is that you get a lot of dogs in training classes who struggle with hyperarousal in other areas of their lives. Um, and as a result, these owners are like persistent enrollees. <laughs> Uh, they stay in training classes for longer and longer periods because they feel like their dog really needs help. And that's probably true. It's just that actually the classes might be intensifying the problem rather than helping it. And this is where a, the screening process would be immensely um, advantageous because uh, these are the dogs you really want to channel into, for example, one-on-one -on -one training or give them a more robust individualized form of help because a group class is really not going to be a good forum for them. And especially not if they're struggling with reactivity and aggression. Um, so these, all of these findings together suggest the importance of appropriate management of classes and uh, ongoing recognition of where group classes might be counterproductive. Um, and that is for individual animals that are poorly socialized toward other dogs. And I realize it's hard to implement a robust screening 
process um, if you have a class where you've got big numbers, right? So this might also be an argument for keeping numbers fairly small. I know when I was teaching in person, control and leash classes, uh, if I had any questions about a dog, and it was pretty clear, I did a, I did a, a fairly extensive behavior questionnaire before class enrollment, and um, if, if there were any questions, I would have a, an in-person interview, you know, session. And I, I found that very helpful because there are a lot of things you really can't tell on paper. Risk factor number three. And actually this, this is, is one, this is not from the KC at all 2013 study. This is one I'm adding. Uh, this is my own addition, and that is pain as a hidden intensifier of behavior issues. Now we know that um, some behaviors are very prominently influenced by pain. They're, you know. Um, aggressive behavior, if a dog has joint issues or arthritis, just being touched or bumped by another dog can, um, can unleash an aggressive episode. Also, we know, and this has now been very well documented, that there is a direct correlation between noise aversion in dogs and pain issues. So um, those are what I would say are prominent, although they're still pretty underdiagnosed correlates of aggressive behavior. Um, the aggression and then the noise aversion issues. But, and I just spent a whole weekend doing a deep dive on this. So it's very with um, Kathy Murphy, who's a veterinarian and a neuroscientist and Hannah Capon, who has started this wonderful new project called the Canine Arthritis Management Project. Fabulous group. I, and I've got the contacts for all that at the end of this, um, my, my talk here. But I guess what is changing now is that people are recognizing Clinicians are recognizing, behavior consultants are recognizing, owners are recognizing that pain-related effects may not be manifested directly. As in, you know, you bump me, I hurt, I'm going to bite you. Um, it may be much more indirect than that, but it may actually be moderating your behavior issue or causing you to present somewhat unusual signs as a pre-existing, for a pre-existing behavioral condition. Um, and I, this is the future right here. Uh, this needs to be much more prominently documented and just become a part of everyone's toolbox when we're working with dogs, no matter what your what your lane is, medical, veterinary, behavior, you know, whatever. Um, but this is the future, recognizing how pain-related effects may not be manifesting directly in my dogs, you know, wanting to bark and lunge at other dogs, but it may be moderating that or influencing it in really important ways. So this is from um, a study that came out last year. So this is really a recent study. This came out from Danny Mills, Daniel Mills, and his wonderful veterinary behavior group at University of Lincoln um, in the UK. And their pen was a part of this. I can't remember who whether this was um, 
Ilana Reisner, or there, there are a number of really thriving veterinary behavior practices in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania B was one of those. Um, but look at these numbers. Uh, proportion of behavior cases, and most of these were aggression, reactivity, separation, anxiety, those were the big three where a painful condition was suspected. At Bristol, 68%. Um, at Lincoln, University of Lincoln, 82%. And this is uh, Missouri, 79%. University of Illinois, University of Missouri. Those numbers are awe-inspiring. <laughs> because they show you how prevalent this is and how unaware we've been. Um, fairly low numbers from Pennsylvania based, and I would say that's probably because they weren't looking for it. Um, you know, I think um, it, the, the disparity between the numbers is quite startling. But in Bristol, for example, look at the, look at the number of different um, issues that were moderating or indirectly influencing behavior issues. Hip issues, that, that's a no brainer. We know about that, but stifle, carpus, spine issues, um, abdominal gut issues, big, uh, that is a huge area that's becoming much more prominent. Um, and then possible allodynia. Um, to be honest, I never heard of allodynia <laughs> until a while ago, like several months ago. But allodynia is the development of neuropathic pain. And in humans, it can come from having had shingles, having had diabetes, and you have un, um, unusually sensitive responses to just being brushed. You know, wearing a cotton t-shirt is painful to you. This is not your normal uh, pain issue. Um, and actually, Kathy Murphy, who is a veterinarian and a neuroscientist, UK-based, believes that um, allodynia is a, is a huge issue in many dogs. Uh, so I, I believe that um, Behavior Vats, who's based in Colorado and New York City, said they were gonna do a whole weekend of Kathy on the neurobiology of pain. <laughs> That's gonna be next summer. And I would encourage everyone to to really keep, you know, keep that on the back burner and uh, try to participate if you can. Um, and you see across the board, a lot of these shared issues, um, hip, stifle, joint issues, by far the majority. But I think the, um, the allodynia, the ears, this was in uh, the Missouri, Illinois contribution where ears, ear infections, ear issues um, contributed 26%. That is a huge amount. So this, if you, if you want to know new frontiers for behavior, I think this is the direction that it's moving and it can't come fast enough right? Because uh, our dogs are suffering. The, this is, this is a, a, a part of their daily lives. And of course, it directly affects their welfare, both behaviorally and physically. So um, this is from Mills. And I, I couldn't agree more with the statement. We argue that there is currently an underreporting of the ways in which pain can be associated with problem behavior. And that certainly would include aggression, hyperreactivity, separation, anxiety. 
those are the big three, which is seriously limiting the recognition of this welfare problem. A review of the caseloads of 100 recent dog cases of several authors indicates that a conservative estimate of about a third, 33% of referred cases involved some form of painful condition. And in some instances, that figure may be more like 80%. That is very um, serious food for thought. Uh, and this is from Hannah Capon. Uh, she is the, a veterinarian who has become a specialist in pain, especially arthritis, canine arthritis management. That is her new group. Uh, CAM, they're putting out all kinds of material. I'm going to upload this to um, so that people can download it. This is a free download from her site, and there are many. Um, if you have an issue with this, I would encourage you to visit her site and see what resources she offers, because we all know from our own experience, if you've got chronic back pain or chronic pain from an injury, um, a previously experienced injury, that can often make you very cranky. Uh, it, it doesn't help. Uh, and I, I think it's not, no different for our dogs. If your dog is struggling with chronic pain and then you layer that into behavior issues, you've got a double whammy. Um, and first you treat the pain. First, you've got to treat the pain and then treat the behavior condition simultaneously, but until you treat the pain, actually, you're probably not going to make much progress with the behavior issue. Um, and I have to say, one of my favorite quotes from this weekend's deep dive into pain and behavior was uh, from Hannah Capon, who said, treat the dog not the radiograph, <laughs> because often, and this is another issue, these more indirect forms of pain and their interactions with behavior problems don't show up on, you know, your kind of first clinical exams. They may not show up on an x-ray or an MRI, but I think it is still important for anyone who is working with dogs to be aware of this, to learn about it, and to um, be an advocate for their dog. Um, just because it doesn't show up on a radiograph or because we don't, we can't point to <laughs> what's happening with our dog doesn't mean there aren't things we can do to help alleviate this. Um, so um, that is the section I wanted to do on risk factors, which I actually think is really important, right? Uh, especially for this group, because you all, you know, are the leading purveyors of dog training in this area. Um, and I honestly, I, I should have checked, but I don't know whether you're offering in-person classes, whether you've started doing that, but, uh, I, every dog training group kennel club that I've spoken to, um, there are some fairly easy things to do that, um, would help immensely. One is to put into place a robust screening procedure. Um, the other is to, you know, contribute to the ongoing education of your fabulous instructors, helping them, for example, learn to spot signs of pain that might be affecting behavior issues, and certainly impeding the learning of dogs in their classes. 
Um, so uh, I told you this was going to be freewheeling. Uh, and I, I really want to get on my soapbox for a minute. And that is to talk about the problematic language of reactivity. It is so not helpful. It is just so not helpful. Um, you know, many people use this word reactivity. And then the question is, what in the heck does it mean? <laughs> uh, if anyone could give me a really good definition of reactivity and why they're using it as a problem, um, you know, I might change my mind, but I've been listening and I haven't heard over the years anyone be able to do that um, because reactivity is not the problem. Every living being on the planet is reactive to their environment and the circumstances in which they find themselves. Um, we need a different vocabulary uh, to talk about behavior issues when they involve reactivity. And for most people, you conjure up the visual picture, right? Well, what is a reactive dog? Oh yeah, it's that dog I saw walking down the sidewalk, pulling on leash, and every dog they saw, they were barking, lunging, growling at, trying to get to, pulling their owner over, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I actually try not to use this word anymore. Uh, it's like I, I, I've dropped impulse control out of my vocabulary because I similarly think impulse control is a very misleading term. And in the question and answer period, I hope someone asks me about why. <laughs> I don't want to take the time right now, but I'd love to talk about it. But in terms of reactivity, um, I prefer the term uh, like hypersensitive. Uh, you, you've got a dog who is probably struggling with sensory overload, among other things. Uh, so there are dogs who are hypersensitive to their environment. That is not a question of reactivity. Um, it really is a question that we need to develop a rhetoric of canine behavior problems that actually fit the issues we're seeing. And I know that's a tall order, but you know, long term, that's one of my projects. So as I said, every living being on the planet is reactive. <laughs> so issue number one is that the term reactivity is misleading. Uh, and instead of reactivity, I preferred to use the language of sensitivity, hypersensitivity, I don't know, there must be other vocabularies out there that would be more accurate and help us more in addressing these issues in our dogs. And then the question becomes how and why a dog has sensitivities, including whether it might be a behavior issue at all. And this is definitely one of the new paradigm shifts in the whole field of dog training, but especially in professional behavior consulting and, um, and anyone who works with dogs, because it's not just their behavior, right? And I've got to tell you, th this, is, this is actually an image from a Facebook post I did. Uh, a few months ago, I can't remember when, and it was inspired by a, um, a poster, and I'm not going to name any names here, but on a, uh, one of the big, huge dog train, professional dog training listservs, let's just leave it at that, um, who wrote in, this was a trainer working with a client saying, I, um, I'm working with a great Pyrenees. I'm working with a family who adopted a great Pyrenees and they are having 
all kinds of problems confining this dog. They work during the day, so they got to put the dog in the crate. The dog doesn't want to go in the crate. It breaks through the baby gates they're putting in the household. Um, it's chewing through the baby gates and the crate. Uh, this dog has issues. This is a problem behavior. And even suggested, should I refer for behavioral medication? to help the dog not have issues with confinement. So I, I responded and I've since expanded on this response. Look, you are dealing with a livestock guarding dog. This is a livestock guarding dog. They are bred to be outside, to patrol the perimeter, to engage in all these modal action pattern behaviors, behaviors that are triggered by stimuli and you are not giving the dog any outlet for what would be a breed appropriate <laughs> expression of what this dog needs to do, um, to, you know, to feel normal, uh, like giving them an outlet to the outside, like giving them much more free roaming exercise, like not trying to lock them in a crate for eight hours a day. And the poster in, the, in their original post had suggested that this dog had crate phobia, right? Confinement phobia, and that we needed to give the dog behavioral medication for confinement phobia. Uh, no, and, and this is a new, paradigm, new old paradigm shift in dog training, take the dog in front of you seriously. What are this dog's needs? You cannot adopt a livestock guarding dog and then expect them to become a household dog who never goes outside and then stays in the crate eight or nine hours a day happily and all the behavioral medication in the world is not gonna change that. Um, so I have to say, I got a little, uh, you know, steamed up <laughs> over this, but uh, I, I think this is really, really important. And this is where programs like Kim Brophy's LEGS program, uh, her LEGS program, and I think, yes, Kim is uh, a good friend and uh, a really fabulous educator. You might have seen her TED talk on why we do, you know, we shouldn't be treating uh, dogs like many humans. Uh, but her legs program is learning environment uh, genetics self. And um, she has a, a really wonderful book called Meet meet your dog that talks about different, um, not specific breeds, but like herding dogs, working dogs, and what their hardwired learning, environmental, and just individual needs might be, and how that would change our approach to behavior issues like reactivity in these dogs. So with the, with the Great Pyrenees, instead of just assuming that the dog's inability to be crated was pathological, let's just say it was really more a function of trying to fit this dog into the wrong size peg. We're trying to fit a round peg into a square hole and that is not going to work. Um, trying to be creative about ways to give dogs appropriate outlets for their uh, genetically predisposed hardwired needs, as well as in terms of how they learn, their environment, et cetera. So important. And Kim's uh, big program now is called the Family Dog Mediation Program. You can take a course, get certified, 
the whole nine yards. I really love it. Sarah Fisher is another one of my really favorite both people and um, practitioners. She created animal-centered education, which is UK-based. Um, if you've seen this um, exercise or this uh, experience called free work, that is Sarah's creation and it is part of animal-centered education. I would love to talk more about free work and the question and answer period uh, because I use it as one of the centerpieces of my slow thinking course. And then there's Andy Hale um, who founded Dog Centered Care. That's a whole Facebook group and the cake framework, right? And cake is this rubric, compassion, awareness, knowledge, empathy. This, this is the rubric that we need to bring to every behavior issue we are addressing in dogs, particularly issues of aggression and reactivity. Um, and Andy has a, a wonderful um, way of talking about being available to the truth of another. And that includes a dog, maybe your dog who's struggling with aggression. Um, maybe you've got two dogs in the household who are fighting. Okay, what is it that we need to learn about their emotional experience? And the only way we can do that is by making ourselves available to the truth of another, which is, I'm sure everyone here knows, you know, it's not that easy. It's really not that easy. Um, knowledge would be exactly knowing much more about who the dog is in front of you. A livestock guarding dog, dog is not going to turn into a dog who is happy being in a crate eight or nine hours a day. Um, compassion and awareness, um, and also compassion for the owners and the dogs, um, you know, because both the human and the dog that you're working with both have emotional truths that we need to learn from and learn about. So finally, <clears throat> this is my logo. This is my slow thinking is life saving for dogs program. Uh, I have a webinar and I'm gonna show you the link for that in a minute. Um, I actually love this logo and I just have to say a little something about it. I'm probably, I hope I'm not running over with time, but this is from an actual client this is an actual dog I worked with in the past year. I love her. Her name is Olive. Um, full permission, everything with her owner. Olive um, had many, many issues with hypervigilance, suspicion of strangers. She is what we would call a reactive, quote unquote, dog. Um, then we started mat training with her and she turned into a mat training superstar. Um, she was able to develop a full body relaxation response. And this is actually from a photograph of Olive that has now become really um, more the norm rather than the exception. I love the grin on her face. She's so relaxed and this was out she was on her mat out on the canal path. You know, the canal that goes behind um, the boatyard restaurant and by those new condos. Um, this is where her mat was. So there were people, dogs, bicycles built for three, boats. Um, Olive paid no attention to them. And her owner was so flabbergasted at this 
that she sent me this picture. And that is the inspiration for the logo. <laughs> um, but here is uh, where you can access, and this will be in the, um, the, of course, the video that's uploaded. You can also go to my website to access the actual link, um, but it's now permanently available on the Clean Run Learning Center platform. Um, it's an on-demand webinar and it comes with CEUs for APDT, IABC, and Karen Pryor. Uh, and this is the place I would start. If you're interested in uh, my slow thinking approach, this is the, this is the place I would start. Um, more recently is my Thinkific course. This is a four-week course, much more robust. I've already finished one um, version of it on Thinkific, and uh, the results were fantastic. I thought uh, if the enthusiasm of the people involved were, was any indication. Um, and I'm not going to go into the whole story behind why and how I developed this. Just the short, um, the short, very short version is uh, I had two female dogs that started fighting in my household, um, Emmy, some of you may know Emmy, and I had another Collie Shepherd mix, Katana. They were going at it regularly. Um, and actually the only bad bite I've ever gotten in my life has not been from a client dog, and I've worked with plenty of quote unquote dangerous dogs. It was from my own dog, right? When I tried to break up a fight um, and that actually set into motion <laughs> everything that's happened to me since, because I decided if we were all gonna survive, I needed to learn something and I needed to devise some more effective approaches because I was not finding traditional desensitization and counter conditioning very effective at all in helping me work through this with my own dogs. Um, and I, if you take the webinar or do the course, you'll hear much more about uh, this, this, that whole scenario and the origin of the course. And this is the book. Um, I, I at least have the cover and I have a lot of it uh, done. It will be coming out, I hope in the spring. Uh, but this is, and you see Olive, this is, this is the photograph that inspired my logo. And then you get your usual, and this is so, I have to say, okay, I recognize it's stereotyped to think that it's really German shepherds who are the most aggressive breed on the planet. Although I have worked with a disproportionate number of shepherds, there are plenty of other candidates for that, um, that scenario. But this happens to be, and I will admit it, a very stereotypical picture of a shepherd. And just to share a secret, I actually think this dog was engaging in protection training. That's where this picture came from. This was not a German Shepherd that wanted to harm a person or another dog. I think they were getting revved up in a, um, you know, in a protection training class. Um, and here are the references. Uh, you, you can look them up. I would encourage you to read them, especially the Mills, the one that came out last year, just really very recent on pain and problem behavior in dogs and cats. Pain and problem behavior in dogs and cats. It's a groundbreaking article. All right, I'm gonna stop talking. Um, I hope I haven't used up all our time. So we have some questions. Okay. All right. Hang on. Do we? 
Okay, so someone did ask, Sue asked, <laughs> what word do you prefer to use if not impulse control? Oh, thank you. Whoever that was. Sue Yanov. Yes, thank you, Sue. Um, well, I, I don't use impulse control because it, I think it's very misleading. And it also has a tinge of the negative to it. You know, I joke with clients uh, when I tell them I don't use this term anymore because to me it sounds too much like juvenile detention. Um, it, it's got a kind of disciplinary feel. And I don't like it when it's applied to children either uh, because honestly, we cannot control our impulses. Not really. I mean, over a long period of time, if you're doing like a biofeedback program, yes, eventually you might be able to modify some of those neurobiological impulses. What we can control is what we do when we have them. So I talk much more about teaching dogs to self-regulate and self-interrupt uh, because I want a dog who can do it independently, not just when I say, stop that. <laughs> I want a dog who can self-regulate and self-interrupt when they need to, to keep things from escalating out of control. Um, so that is my preferred way of talking about what many people still call impulse control but I, this is where I think a new vocabulary can be really illuminating and actually really helpful. Um, given the way that that old term impulse control was used um, and, it, and having this kind of disciplinary tinge to it, I just don't, I don't feel like it speaks to the reality of what we struggle with and it's misleading to boot. Because if you're fearful, you're afraid, you can't control that initial startle response. You really can't. Maybe over a long period of time, it could change somewhat. But uh, what we can do is change what we do when we experience that startle. Um, so that that is the short answer. But obviously, it is it's a much more, um, I think, complex issue uh, than the short answer <laughs> can give, but that, that's what I would say right now, yeah. Okay, so we also have, what do you think of the role of genetics as predisposing fearful, anxious, and stress behavior resulting in aggressive outbursts, such as the A22 in Belgian Malinois currently being studied at UC Davis? I don't know, because I think there's a, still a lot to be said about that study. One thing I would say is I am not a determinist, right? Even though we recognize that, a, for example, a genetic predisposition to fear can be passed down from mother to pup, um, it takes epigenetics. It takes the environment, experience, learning, all of those things um, to activate that predisposition. So I am not and will never be a biological determinist. Whatever your dog's genetics are, they can learn differently. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't take things like modal action patterns seriously. Like in the case of the Great Pyrenees that they wanted to turn into you know, a, a little house dog and confine him for 10 hours a day. No, you cannot do that. You, that is where you have to take the genetics, the breed history, the purpose for which the dog was born, even if they've never seen a single cow or sheep, doesn't matter. They still are born with that kind of a hardwired purpose and that is going to come out in one way or another. Um, so I, I think that is what Kim Brophy's program is all about, 
how to take genetics seriously, but not be a biological determinist. Um, and I honestly would be astonished if they could ever say that the aggressive behavior of my Malinois, my Belgian Shepherd, my Cane Corso, any other kind of dog would be solely due to one, uh, the expression of one gene. I just don't think that's going to happen. And I, I just can't imagine that it would be that reductionistic. Aggression is too complex a behavior to be talking about it in really reductionistic terms. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I have a question slash comment. Yeah. And it is directly related to what you said about the great peer that was yeah. not a crate dog, right? Not a house pet. Yeah. I have Akitas and Akitas are supposed to be an aggressive breed. And one of my dogs is atypical and is very social and outgoing. And the other is much more Akita-like. And he is actually the most Akita-like Akita I've ever had. And for the most part, because he's been exposed to a lot of other dogs, he is fine around other dogs. And every once in a while, he's a jerk. <clears throat> And I get the, oh, well, he's reactive to other dogs. And how much of that is really reactivity and how much of that is just his genetic programming? Mm -hmm. And how, how, I guess the question which you can't answer is how do we shift the paradigm? So we're not talking about dogs that are acting the way they're bred to react, genetically predispositioned to react. How do we stop blaming them for being reactive when they are being what we bred them to be as humans. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't think the answer is not to, you know, um, have genetics trump learning. Yeah. Genetics can never trump learning. Learning is way too powerful. And, uh, you know, you can have a dog that's born with all the predisposition in the world to certain behaviors and then they turn out to be you know this a star therapy dog or or you know they they go against all the so-called innate breed characteristics for that dog that's what you're describing yes in yeah. in your akita and that is the self part right yeah like in kim's learning environment genetics and then self, because that every dog is an individual. And I think people want blueprints. Right. They want, blue, they want blueprints and training. They want blueprints to say, okay, my dog is a blank. A pit bull, an Akita, a German Shepherd, a Connie Corso, and therefore X, Y, and Z. Never, never, because the learning process changes all that. Um, every dog is an individual and how they mediate those hardwired uh, modal action patterns and innate predispositions is different for every dog. Um, and thank God for that. Yeah. Right? Because uh, dogs are they're just fabulous in their resilience and their ability to adapt to an infinite number of contexts to really do some profound and surprising learning that we probably thought they would never be able to do because yeah. they're blank. <laughs> yeah, because they are that resilient. I mean, my boy dog, he is, he is a typical male Akita and for the most part, he is really good around other dogs. For the most part, he is really good around other dogs. Occasionally, he can be a jerk. And when he does react, it's generally out of fear. He bloated over the summer and the vet clinic, he, I, he, I was out of town and he was up in Orchard Park. And every time I talked to the vet, they were saying, I'm sure they would say things like, I'm sure there were things about him you really like because he was terrified. So he was acting like a jerk. Mm -hmm. He was being aggressive because he was terrified. And I mm -hmm. would say to them, 
he's terrified. You have to take that into account. And it's as if they could not hear me. He was terrified. Yeah. 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 Um, and in pain, right? Because he had yeah. a major surgery and he was bloating before yeah. the major surgery. So, well, I think one of the um, big, I, I don't know if this is, because this has been ongoing for a while, but it's come into more prominence recently. And that is the movement to drop labels when you're talking about dog behavior especially problem behavior like aggression. Like once you say aggressive dog, you have put a whole box around that dog and people have developed expectations about it. And almost all of them are misleading, misleading. I mean, um, you know, breed specific legislation, but the fact that and I'm sure many, many of you have had this experience. If, if you have a dog who's struggling uh, with worry about the environment or struggling with their relationships with other dogs, and then you say something to a family member or a coworker or the person next to you on the bus, my dog is struggling with aggression. <laughs> You're gonna get a, you know, a tsunami yeah. of bad advice from people who have no experience with this, but who have many, many, many labels and expectations that they've learned um, that, you know, that are just commonplace in our society. It's interesting that you say that, and this will be the last thing I'll say because I'm I'm hogging up the conversation. (laughs) All All of my neighbors were stunned to hear that Akitas are on the bad dog list because they don't really know a lot about dogs and they've met my dogs and they're polite and they're well-mannered and they tend to be friendly. Even the boy that we have now, he, if he knows you, he's friendly. All of them were stunned that Akitas are on the bad dog list because it is training. Yeah. It's training. Yeah. Okay. I'll stop hogging up the conversation. <laughs> and tell people that they, tell pe- the other people in the audience that go ask questions, folks. That's what she's here for. <laughs> Who's got a question? Yeah. This is Sue. Can you hear me, Nancy? Yes, we sure can. Sue. Okay. So um, I agree a lot of it is training, but there are some, you know, traits that are predisposed in certain breeds. That's why they are bred for certain tasks. And Absolutely. You, you can't discount that. And it, you cannot overcome all of that with training. I don't think you can. I totally agree with you. Yes. And certainly not training as many people construe it now, because I, I think many, not you, but many clients I work with, for example, uh, regard training as a laundry list. You know, I want you to train my dog not to do A, B, C, and D. It's really behavior suppression, but I totally agree with you. That, that is the whole point of like the, the, the story of the great Pyrenees. No, he wasn't uh, suffering from confinement phobia and actually no amount of behavioral medication or behavior modification would change his ability to be created for 10 hours a day and have a good quality of life. I, I'm totally with you, Sue. I, I think that is absolutely true, but it is a struggle to get many people to accept that. Yes, I agree. They they like a certain breed for a certain reason, but it's not. It doesn't fit into their lifestyle or what they want to deal with. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and then they try to change the behavior of the dog in front of them in ways that are actually counterproductive for the dog. One thing we all have to ask ourselves when we're asking our dogs to change their behavior is, does this have any relevance for you, the dog? <laughs> does, this, is, does this have any relevance for you? Um, because long-term permanent behavior change comes when dogs recognize and internalize 
the change as something that is not only relevant for them, but helps them feel better, helps them have a better quality of life, not because it's something that makes our life easier, right? Like I have a big dog who's destroying things. I'm just going to put him in a crate for 10 hours a day. That makes my life easier, but it is such poor welfare management for this dog and it will come back to haunt you every time. I agree, thank you. Another question, how can I get my beagles to stop sniffing? How, say what? <laughs> oh, good luck with that. That's all I can say, good luck, Sue. <laughs> And when you find out, can you tell me? Yeah, I'll let you know if it happens. <laughs> Thanks for the laugh. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, where's all the questions, you guys? Maybe I talk too much. Um, Yes, uh, fibromyalgia. You're right. I'm just, I'll just say, I'm a little surprised that no one has asked about the association with being in a dog training class of aggression with being in a dog training class for more than four weeks. Well, what methods did that dog training class use? If they use harsh methods or positive punishment, then it's not surprising. So yeah. did they parse that out? Yeah, and actually I'll say the survey doesn't really parse it out either. That would be one of my first questions. Well, what are they teaching <laughs> in the class? And it goes beyond just poor management. Uh, but yes, if you're using positive punishment and aversive methods, I make sense uh, because all the accumulating scientific data points toward aversive methods means a much higher risk of dogs developing um, aggressive behavior. Anecdotally, here I am again, taking over the conversation. <laughs> As you know, I teach nose work and I make sure that every team understands, the human understands that everything about nose work is fun. The start line is fun. The search is fun. The end line routine is fun. Everything about nose work is fun. And the dogs are so happy. They're just, they, they know they're going to nose work. They get, the handler gets the harness out, they put them on and the dogs are like, they're, it's like they light up like Christmas trees. So it's, I would be very interested to know what kind of techniques are associated with that increase in aggression, because if anything, if anything, I see better, more focused, happier, less reactive, more self-controlling dogs because of the way, everything about the nose work technique, everything well, about- Yes, and because you, you put so much into good, practices, best practices for your class. We know that sniffing itself is inherently yeah. calming yes. for dogs and for nose work, chances are the dogs are not chaotically running around, free roaming, interacting with other dogs, et cetera. I no, mean- No dog on dog interaction. That's yeah, the well, there you go. Work. Yeah, yeah and, there, and that, that explains a lot of it. COVID didn't really put the kibosh on what we did because it's always been you stay you stay apart from other dogs. There's no yeah. dog interactions. Yeah, it's all about the it's all about that dog and that team and no dog and dog interaction. Yeah, yeah. And even after class, I tell people you want to have your dogs play, go someplace else. Yeah, yeah. Laura. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This. Uh, hi. Uh, my Kenzie, who worked with you um, yeah. some time ago, Anna. has been in uh, Nancy's nose work class and it has improved her in a thousand ways, but um, 
listening to some of the things about the dog classes gives me a new insight because as soon as I tried to start going to group classes, uh, inevitably there were people who never did anything but hold the end of their leash and uh, had no respect for other dogs. And that mm -hmm. got to be such a problem that I finally stopped doing that entirely, which is how I really got to concentrate on the nose work. Since then, uh, while we're not close to other dogs, uh, Kenzie gets to look at the dogs and watch their behavior um, and she can make a decision. And this is sort of a, a gradual thing that's happened and I'm sure has happened with other dogs who have had a problem with group dog things. That when the dog has a chance at eight feet or 10 feet or 12 feet to sit there and watch other dogs from a distance, I found that gradually she would recognize the other dogs. And now when we come into a, a session where there are other dogs around, because we're all waiting to go our turn, <clears throat> her tail wags and she recognizes other dogs. But on the occasions where we've been in a public park uh, and a strange dog walks in, uh, there's an immediate difference. Now she's also gotten a lot, instead of barking and jumping and leaping and carrying on, she now, with the work that uh, you and I did with her, with uh, just getting her to calm down and come back to me and so forth, she very lightly whines and that's all. But I know then she recognizes it's another dog or I may not see another dog that she recognizes as a threat. Um, and I think, this goes back to one of the problems that I did some teaching at IDTC and I always had, even when I was teaching, a problem where there were so many dogs. When you have 12 or 13 dogs in a class, even if you have the best helper in the world with you, you cannot control everything that's going on or even right. keep track of it. Right. I think that's something that... Um, I'd like to see happen more in our classes. Yes, it doesn't make them much of a money maker when you only have four or five dogs, but it means that the quality of the teaching is going to go up and the experience for the individual dog is definitely going to go up. Fabulous, Hannah. Thank you for that contribution. And I can't thank you enough for talking about how you are giving Kenzie the time to actually cognitively process what is going on in her environment and how transformative that has been for her. Um, that is such a, seems like a simple thing, but so many of us are not doing that because if we have a dog with issues, what we tend to do is micromanage our dog every second got to have that dog micromanage. The idea of letting them have the time to process their environment in their own time and way from an appropriate distance, to be sure, um, is actually, I think, transformative. And, um, you know, if, if anyone does take the slow thinking class or the webinar, you will see videos in there of me always saying, wait, wait, give the dog time to think, wait. <laughs> That's like the only thing I'm saying in, in the video because um, we, we, uh, we humans tend to micromanage way too much. Um, I, I think I, I'm, so encouraged by hearing you talk about Kenzie and how much nose work has helped her, but also how much just giving her the time and space to process her environment in her own way has, um, has helped her. And that is one of the fundamental pieces of my slow thinking program. Well, um, and in connection, um, to the, the thing about breeds, she is four different, actually five different kinds of herding dog. 
and their <laughs> purpose, their whole thing is that they want to be in charge of the situation and the environment. And so for them, as a herding dog, you don't want a lot of strange other animals around. And so right. it, it's not unjustified in the least. But I will tell you that she's gotten to the stage now. We went in some rally classes in a, a obedient show in the big show down at Binghamton. And for us, it was sort of, I knew that she was going to have a problem. At, it was going to be a nightmare. You're in a hockey rink with dogs all around and there's no way to <laughs> do much about that. But I always bring, I mean, she was in a crate Yeah, because she's had good crate training, but not uh, over overworked in a, a crate it was her shelter getting from the ringside in the crate into the ring was a little dicey I must say the first couple of times but when she got in even though she could certainly see and sense all the other dogs around she never put a foot wrong I never had to repeat anything there was no problem whatsoever so I think it is possible to get to that stage after a long time. Um, but I, I, as you say, decisions. you have to wait. You just have to take time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I often, one of my favorite things to say is the greatest gift we can give to our dogs, especially dogs struggling with behavior issues like aggression and reactivity is to give up our expectations of them because chances are those expectations are counterproductive, not helping. And uh, you would be amazed what might happen when you give up your expectations and then give your dog time to process their environment. Um, doesn't sound like much, but Actually, we know how hard it is to give up expectations amongst ourselves. So I'm not suggesting that's easy, but I just love hearing, you know, Kenzie is making great decisions about her behavior. Um, and that, that is exactly what we want from our dogs because we can't control the environment. Oh, no. We can't put our dogs in a bubble, although we would like to. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple of quick questions here. Judy asks, what is Fisher, spit it out, what is Fisher's free work? Oh, I'm just thrilled somebody asked me that. Um, free work is setting up an experiential obstacle course. Um, you, you might have a bubble wrap underneath you might have um, fake grass, you might have step ladders. These are all things you would find in your own household or your own environment. You would have different kinds of containers like a kid's pool filled with balls, put treats all over. And then the dog goes into this area and it's a usually a contained area or in a room, you take all the um, accoutrements off a dog, a flat buckle collar, no harnesses, no head halters, no nothing. A dog goes in absolutely naked and we are not in there at all. And our job is to observe. This is a fabulous way to observe, Sarah Fisher developed this as a, a way to see, for example, what was happening with a dog's gait. You, you could really spot physical issues a dog was having just from a dog's tendency to navigate the course either clockwise or counterclockwise. If they go one way all the time, that probably means they have a little stiffness on the opposite side. Um, you can see your dog with a different level of granularity doing free work. And I've worked with very simple courses and I've worked with very elaborate courses. I use them, and this is a contribution that I think my slow thinking 
program is made, I use them to teach dogs social problem solving skills because those are exactly the skills that dogs struggling with hypersensitivity and um, aggressive behavior probably do not have. Uh, they're, they're not weighing the options and then deciding on an optimal response. They have an automatic response and that is I'm gonna launch <laughs> or escape, you know, um, this really scary stimulus in front of me, whether that's a dog, a kid on a skateboard, a car, who knows what it is. And so free work gives you an opportunity to see what your dog is doing um, in a scenario uh, where we're not there and they are free to explore and negotiate that scenario totally on their own time and in their own way. And you would be surprised what a huge difference that makes and all the things we can learn about um, free work. So I would be happy to give a workshop on free work. <laughs> uh, if IDTC is ever interested in this, just call me, I'll do it for free. I love this, um, I love this exercise and this way of having our dogs experience the environment and um, it's easy to do. You can do it in your own home. You can do it in your backyard or you can make it more elaborate. So uh, thank you for asking me the question. And um, I, I hope actually more people might be interested in it. A couple of other questions. I'm a little worried about the reference to prong collars to positive punishment and correlate correlated with reactivity. I've trained a few dogs and we used prong collar initially then fade quickly as it wasn't needed. Prong collars are discussed in beginner classes often. Is there a place we should be concerned or mindful of potentially negative consequences of using them? Well, I, I understand and appreciate the question. Um, I don't use prong collars. They, you know, I, I don't because I consider them punishment. A uh, dog's neck is highly sensitive. Even the blunted plastic ones cause pain. I don't ever want a dog to, um, you know, I, I just don't ever want to use pain as a way of controlling the dog. So I would probably spend a lot of time trying to develop alternatives. And I, I appreciate that you've had a different experience. I get that. Uh, but it's not something I would use. I do categorize it as punishment. Um, and I think there are much better ways to teach dogs to self-regulate and to self-interrupt, which is what we want, right? People use those for dogs who pull or who lash out or who are lunging and barking. There, there are better ways to address those issues than punitive technology. Um, and I would certainly never uh, use them as a go-to technology in a dog training class. Um, that's just me. But I, I think when you read this position statement on humane dog training by the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior, and these are the veterinary behaviorists, the experts, um, completely uh, prong collars, choke chains, all the, you know, the, the pantheon of punitive technologies are off the table. And in fact, they recommend that veterinarians not refer their clients, their patients to trainers who use these technologies and these techniques. So that is a pretty strong statement in my book. But I will post the position statement so you all can read it on your own and draw your own conclusions. 
Ray asks, is it better to give a dog with high prey drive outlets like lure coursing or barn hunt, or is it better not to encourage it? Ooh, that's a great question. That's a good question. That is a good with real, question. <laughs> my Akita has really high prey drive. Sometimes <laughs> it jumps after low flying small planes. Yeah. Well, or hot air balloons. Yeah. I worked with a dog who, you know, lived right in the landing alley in Lansing where they land at hot air balloons and what? that big open field, you know, and so he did the same thing. Anyway, uh, to answer your question, because this is another paradigm shift in how to address behavior issues in dogs. Okay, here was the old way. The old way is just to suppress it completely, if you could. And of course, that was always unsuccessful. I mean, have you really, unless you were using heavy, heavy punishment, and you know, that brings up all kinds of welfare issues for your, for your dog. But um, it used to be, okay, we're either going to suppress it totally. Can't do that, actually. And I would say it's inhumane to do that. If you have a, a Jack Russell Terrier, or you've got a hunting dog, or you've got a dog who's bred for high prey drive, you have got to work with the dog in front of you. And so now, let me actually, there's a step left out. Suppressing it doesn't work. And then people thought, okay, I'm just gonna use some counter conditioning desensitization. You know, so every time my dog sees a bunny, or a deer, I'm gonna give them a treat. <laughs> so I would like to take a survey of how many of us have done that and had it utterly fail. Uh, <laughs> doesn't work, <laughs> doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because chase and that um, <clears throat> prey drive instinct, it, it's like an addictive behavior in dogs. There is almost no reward we can give. <laughs> Don't mention bunny in front of the beagles. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's no reward we can give our dogs that is equal to the thrill of the chase and the neurochemical dump that they are getting while they do it. Um, dopamines, adrenaline, cortisol, norepinephrine, my goodness. Uh, it's no wonder they absolutely love it. Um, and it's also true that in the chase mode, dogs literally shut down other senses. So you could be right next to your dog yelling, stop, stop, and they would not hear you. So what are some new ways to develop um, responses to this in your dog, because I don't want to let my dog just go out and kill the wildlife in my backyard. I am really not big on dogs doing that. I don't think, I think actually when your dog has successfully killed, it makes your job to redirect that behavior so much harder. So in this case, I turn to my colleague and friend, Simone Mueller, um, who is located now in the UK, but is originally from Germany. And she developed what is called a predation substitution training model. And the model here is to allow the dog to practice the safe parts of the predatory sequence. Not the, not the kill parts, not the grab, bite, and kill, or even the chase, but the eye stalk, letting them look, yes. Um, and then within that, giving them, uh, you know, opportunities to practice the eye stalk by building in these self-regulating sequences like, okay, you, you eye stalk and then reorient to me, we'll play a little game of tug or whatever, and then you can go back 
to iStock. So there's a lot of pre-MAC principle built into it. Um, I have actually used this with a number of dogs because as you can imagine, many, many of the dogs I work with have intense prey drive and it's problematic intense prey drive as in, you know, they're going after the grandkids that it was the next step from stalking the horses in the corral and the wildlife in the backyard. Um, these were actually Rhodesian Ridgebacks. Um, so I have had excellent results from giving the dog safe and appropriate outlets for the safe parts of the predatory sequence. It's not easy to do it. And I suggest if you find this interesting, I can post a link for Simone's course. She's got one on Udemy. I think she has another, although I'm not sure it's available on demand on Grisha Stewart's website. I've taken it. I know Simone. I heartily endorse it. And it's one I recommend to clients all the time. This is also like using the Whippet game uh, to allow a dog to practice safe parts of the chase sequence, but build in self-regulatory um, buffer zones so that the dog learns, oh, wow, this is fun. Uh, but what comes with it is my ability to actually disengage from the prey. Um, so I think this is a really terrific new approach to what has been a long-standing behavior issue for many, many people who have either just given up, you know, they give up on doing anything with their dog's prey drive, or it ends up the prey drive gets so intense they have to surrender um, the dog or, or worse. Um, so I, I'm very encouraged that this is new thinking, thinking outside the box, because the old ways of just, you know, you see the bunny, I give you a treat, it doesn't work. Um, and if it does work, I'd suggest that's probably because your dog's spray drive was never that intense in the first place. Um, we're, we're talking about really intense prey drive here. And the, these are dogs that actually need to engage in this behavior. It's like a physical and um, emotional need they have. Um, so who, who asked the question, Ray? That was Ray, yeah. Ray, thank you. Um, yes, and I, I hope I've lit some fires under people. So um, let, if there's one more, we'll take one more. Otherwise, I think we're, you know, we should probably wind things up. Anyone else have a quick question before we sign off for the night? Going, going, gone. Thank you so much, Laura, for your time and your expertise and your sense of humor. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And we'll be in touch. Yes, yes. Um, and look for, um, I'm, I'm gonna send Nancy some handouts. And I'll forward those, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll them out to the yeah. club, yep. And if you, if you have any uh, questions, just feel free to email me or send me a contact form from my website. Uh, that's all good. And um, remember, let's do a workshop on free work. Yes, actually, I will be in touch about organizing that for the club. That would be fabulous. Good. All right. Good. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks all for right. tuning in, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. <laughs>